Am I on now? Okay, well, <laughs> we're getting used to uh, the new system. Brigitte Gabriel with us and Tucker Carlson coming to Canada. Okay, very nice. Well, Canada, it's still freezing cold up here. Uh, record, you know, temperatures uh, below below zero being set all over Canada. And uh, I don't know, I think it's kind of nice. A little bit of global colding doesn't bother me at all. I talked to a farmer today and he says, oh, he's seen weather like this uh, 20, 30 years ago. This is nothing. Don't be alarmed by the climate alarmist because there's nothing uh there's nothing good or truth, truthful or honest that they're they're talking to you about. We have a huge show. Brigitte Gabriel is with us. I'm so excited. It took me a long time to get her, and I did not have inside, uh, you know, traction to get to her. And so I was beside myself trying to get her here. We also have somebody to just briefly tell us about Tucker Carlson being here. So you know that I love to open the show by reading from my dad's Bible. I've, I've determined that I think this this Bible is actually over 60 years old. And uh, you can tell it is absolutely worn. And I just, I, I don't remove anything from it. My dad's got all kinds of notes that he took. But I opened it up to this. So 1 Peter 3, verse 17. Remember, I only read something he's underlined. I figure that he thought it was <clears throat> important. And so I, I read that. 1 Peter 3, 17. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil doing. That's in 60 year old English, uh, ye, you know? But do we, yeah, what's that? Old English. Old English. 1300s. Oh, in the 1300s, yeah. But so I don't know how old this Bible is, but I think my dad got it about 60 years old because we have pictures of uh, us as kids um, around my dad. So let's bring on the wonderful uh, gentleman from Calgary. Have you heard that Tucker Carlson is coming to? Come into town in Edmonton and Calgary. Well, bring them on. Uh, thank you very much for waiting in the background there. Um, you guys are doing awesome. Like to bring in Tucker, I'm surprised it's not canceled. Is it going to make it to actually being able to have him and Danielle Smith there together? Oh, yeah. Um, th there's always the possibility that the naysayers will have their day, but I don't think so because there would be a lot of legal complications at that point because we've got... Uh, pretty firm commitments with both of the venues that, well, as I understand it. So, so from the, from the event organizers, I'm not actually one of the event organizers. I'm just trying to promote it here in Edmonton. So. Okay. Vince, tell us about, uh, there's two, there's two dates and they're going to go firmly through, uh, uh, Calgary is first, right? Yeah. So, so they're both on the same day and it's a week uh, wow. It's basically this coming Wednesday. So it's January 24th. Uh, and uh, first, uh, Tucker is going to be in Calgary and he's going to be interviewing Danielle Smith there. Uh, that was the original event, uh, but it, it, it was, it's being staged at the TELUS Convention Center uh, and the capacity was 4,000 or is 4,000. And it sold out in less than 48 hours. So, so then they contacted the Tucker team, asked him if he would be available for also going up the same day in the evening to Edmonton. And because the first one sold out so fast, uh, they thought they would uh, take a chance and, and at, they staged it at Rogers Place, which is the home of the Edmonton Oilers. It's the uh, a venue that has... a uh, capacity of about 14,000 when it's a staged event, when it's a hockey and you can have the whole uh, arena, it's, uh, it's I think, 18,000 or so. So, so anyway, um, we're having it in uh, Edmonton at 7.30 on the same day. So. Okay, so, um, do you, so, so there, you've got some tickets left in Edmonton, but not Calgary. Calgary's a done deal, right? Nobody can Correct. go there anymore? Yeah. Oh, okay. They, they, there may be one or two. I, I've seen them selling on StubHub for 
ridiculously high prices yeah. now. But uh, um, but the Edmonton event, uh, because it got off to a later start, it was about a month after that they started to promote that one, and it's you know a significantly higher venue, and it's Edmonton. Um, meant that uh, we've had a, a, a little a little more challenge, but nonetheless, it looks like we're going to have about almost 8,000 people at the Edmonton event. Uh, so, so, and uh, we just heard yesterday from Rogers that we won't be able to open the upper bowl. Uh, so, so it's going to be packed. Uh, it'll be lower bowl and the floor. So, yeah. That is, well, it's a very NDP uh, kind of place, right? So I don't know if Canada's ready for Tucker Carlson, right? Yeah, all 20 MLAs out of Edmonton are NDP right now. So, yeah, yeah it's uh, and uh, so and they're not too happy to see Tucker coming. I sure. know. That's why I'm so excited. It's <laughs> awesome. It's awesome for Canada. I'm, I'm really I'm so proud of you and the team for for being, uh, you know, so, so having such foresight as to bring in Tucker Carlson. We need him here. And, uh, you know, my next guest, Brigitte Gabriel, think about let's try to get her here too. We, Canada needs to have Brigitte Gabriel. And I'm sure she probably has spoken at places, but she'd be somebody fantastic to sell Absolutely. out an auditorium as well. Oh, for sure. In fact, I think that what we've established here, especially from the demand in Calgary and also in Edmonton, is that there is now... Uh, a pretty established need uh, or, or demand for event like this. Uh, and I think it would be great for conservatives of all stripes, Christian conservatives, fiscal conservatives, to be, and to be able to meet and share ideas, uh, not only from the different levels of government, municipal, provincial, and federal, but also from the different regions of the country. And so essentially, I think what we've seen here is that there is a demand for a CPAC North type deal, uh, where where you know you know specific American speakers can come forward, but also we've got a lot of rising stars, uh, conservative, uh, common sense conservatives in in Canada now. Uh, Polyev is an obvious example, also, and and Leslin. I I think that there's really a, an opportunity here for for something even bigger to become regular. So. I'm excited about it, Vince. Uh, thank you for that. So if people want tickets right now, they go to take, takingbackalberta.ca backslash that, events. Is that it? Yeah, that's right. Or they can, uh, yeah, just, or they're, they're also on the takingbackalberta.ca site. They can uh, contact uh, the organizers, right? They can just do a contact us. I believe there's still seats available um, the, the, one of the bigger sponsors is taking, take back Alberta. There are a lot of other sponsors, uh, Alberta prosperity project, um, uh, Sean Newman podcast, rebel news, uh, a Western standard. Uh, so they all have, um, access to some tickets. So, so they may still have one or two available. So, but okay, the best way around. taking back Alberta is the best one to, to reach. Okay. Through. And yeah. is Rex Murphy going to be there in person? Yes. So, oh. so in Edmonton, uh, what happened Black is Buster. the, yeah, so it's Rex Murphy and Lord Conrad Black in Edmonton. Nice. Um, and that was because Premier Smith was not available originally for the Edmonton event. So, so they contacted those two gentlemen and they both stepped forward. And then later the event, the reason why Danielle couldn't go to the event was a leader's dinner in Red Deer. But as soon as the Edmonton event became known. So many people started to vacate the Red Deer Leaders Dinner that they basically <laughs> rescheduled it, and she became a free agent. So she's right. going to be there too in Edmonton now. Okay. Uh, so she'll be doing the opening address, right? So, Fantastic! So, yeah. I yeah. love it. Thank you so very much, uh, Vince. Uh, this is a great, a great project, a great event. Thank you all for putting it on. We're excited to be part of it. I'm flying out. I'm going to be seeing Tucker Carlson uh, live and in person, and I, I am so excited because I have shared his clips. We've, you know, done all kinds of things. To, I, I've encouraged all my viewers to be watching him, so I probably helped you to put on a very successful event. Right actually. on. Well, thank you very much, Laura. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> all right. Take care, Vince. We'll talk yeah, to you thank again. Thank you. You too. God bless. Thank you. Bye -bye. God bless. Bye-bye. Okay. Very, very wonderful. So. Without further ado, make sure you get your tickets for Tucker Carlson. You gotta go. I mean, Calgary's done, but you can make it up to Edmonton. I'm, I'm actually going. I'm, I'm excited. So, um, 
Our next guest, uh, I am so uh, honored to have her on. I've been watching her clips, sharing them around. Um, some people really love Brigitte, uh, and some people are kind of mad because she speaks the truth and it doesn't sit well. So she is a courageous, daring, incredible woman telling the truth about what is going on. So she is from the war-torn bomb shelter of Lebanon to the boardroom of America. This is what uh, her path and journey has been. Gay, uh, Gabrielle is a startling illustration of the American dream, an inspiration for women throughout the world. She has balanced the demands of a successful career uh, with the equally challenging duties of motherhood. It isn't easy, but we do it. Her passionate lectures, Lectures emit a positive and empowering message to act on one's beliefs and follow your dreams. Brigitte Gabriel is named one of the top 50 most prominent speakers in America. She is a New York Times bestselling author and chairman of the largest national security grassroots organization in the U.S. with over one million members. She has keynoted galas from Switzerland to Australia, London to New York, and addressed world leaders prime ministers and organizations such as the United Nations, the United States Congress, the British Parliament, the FBI, thank you for doing that, Brigitte, and many others. Brigitte Gabriel, we welcome you to the show. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me with you. Well, it's a real honor for us, and I'm grateful for your voice speaking the truth. We're just seeing a lot of things that are disturbing to us, and I know that you comment on these things. Um, were you actually born, you were born in Lebanon? I was born and raised in Lebanon uh, all my youth. Uh, I came to the United States in 1989. Wow, wow, thank you. Um, so. So what do you have to say about what we're seeing? Could, could you shed any light then from your Lebanon right next to Israel, just north of Israel, right? As we have watched the outfall of what happened on October 7th, what are some of your thoughts on this very difficult time that's happening over there? Well, look, I have dealt with Palestinian terrorism ever since I was a child. You know, Lebanon, I was born and raised in Lebanon, which used to be the only majority Christian country in the Middle East. We were open-minded. We were fair. We were tolerant. We were multicultural. We had open border policy. Boy, does that sound familiar so far? Um, we welcomed everybody into our country because we wanted to share with them the westernization, which we had created in the heart of the Middle East. Unfortunately, we imported people into our country who did not share our values. In 1975, uh, my 9-11 happened to me when radical Palestinian Islamists blew up my home, bringing it down, burying me under the rubble wounded. I ended up in a hospital for two and a half months and later ended up living in a bomb shelter underground in an eight by 10 room without electricity, without water and very little food. And that's where I lived from the age of 10 till the age of 17, robbed of my youth. So when I talk about Palestinian terrorism, I'm not talking about something that happened yesterday. I'm talking about the same type of barbarity being repeated decade after decade after decade by the Palestinians against what they perceive their enemies, whether it's Jews. In our case, it was the Christians in Lebanon. The massacres that the Palestinians committed on October 7th in Israel were the exact same type of massacres they had committed early on in Lebanon. And, and, and one of the first massacred was in the uh, city of the Moor, where the Palestinians would walk into a bomb shelter. They would find a baby with a mother and a father hiding. They would take one leg of the baby, tie it to the mother, and another leg tie it to the father and pull the parents apart, splitting the child in half. They would split a mother's abdomen, pregnant woman, and pull the baby out while she was alive. They crucified men and cut off their genitals and put it in their mouth. So what they did on October 7th was just what they do, commit barbaric attack that now the world is saying, no, it can't happen. Uh, you know, uh, I remember debating with friends of mine from Jordan, Christians who say to me, oh, Brigitte, Israel is lying. This is all AI. This is all artificial intelligence. It's not really true. The Palestinians did not do that. This is just artificial intelligence generated videos. 
And the reality is, what I tell them is not only they did it to the Israelis on October 7th, they have done it to the Christians back in Lebanon in the 70s, and artificial intelligence did not exist. So what we are dealing with is barbarism on a world scale, and the world needs to wake up and understand that we need to deal with this barbarity once and for all. And good for Israel, who has gone into Gaza and is demolishing the terrorist infrastructure. They need to do that in order for them to survive. What do you make of uh, some of these? Because this is what the the left puts all through the, um, you know, through the social media feeds. Oh, you've got, you know, dead kids and all that. I keep wondering, what are what are these parents? Why are they not getting out of harm's way? Uh, they're in the middle of Gaza. And, and there's even pictures, uh, the IDF, I know, because I, I follow a feed of Amir Sarfati. And uh, so, so you've got um, like a, a Palestinian mother and her child wandering through the war torn. You've got the IDF in there and they're fighting, you know, they, they've got, you know, on the ground battles going on as well as blowing um, some of these Hamas um, hiding centers up and, and, the, and the tunnels. But they still are there with their children. And I don't have a lot as a mother. I don't have a lot of patience for that because I'm like, as a mom, I would have my children as far away as possible from any of this carnage. Because the Palestinian people in general are invested in the cause. So I know that people in America and in the West and Canada, all the West, they think, well, Hamas is a terrorist organization, but the population, the civilians are different. Well, here's what you need to understand. Hamas is not really an official army. Hamas is a militia born out of the people, elected by the people, that, that rules the people, but the people are Hamas. So when you see families who are refusing to leave, it's because their sons their, uh, are involved in Hamas. Their sons are leaders. Their sons are fighters. They are invested in the cause. They say, this is our home. By golly, we're all going to become martyrs. We are not going to leave. And our contribution to the cause, if we cannot fight as suicide bombers, our contribution is dying fi sabilillah, to die in the cause of Allah. So even our pictures, when we are dead will contribute to the success of the cause. We in the West, or people who come from a Judeo-Christian background, we do not think in martyrdom type thinking. We don't think about, oh, I'm going to become a martyr and my son or daughter are going to become a martyr. You're a mother. I'm a mother. I would die before I would let anybody touch a hair on my child's head. I would die defending them. I will take them out of harm's way. I will hide them. I will give up my life to make sure that my kids are removed so far away from harm as possible. That's not the way they think. And that's why you are seeing all these, um, you know, the casualties that we are seeing in Gaza because they are not leaving. They are, they are remaining there. Uh, they are belligerent about the war. And that's why you're seeing a lot of casualties. That makes a lot of sense. And wh what do you make of the, um, what is the tie between Hamas, Hezbollah, and Iran? Is, is this all the same? You know, this is a, a perfect example for us. This is a great opportunity to explain the difference between them. What brings them together is the same ideology and their hatred of their enemy. And their enemy are, the enemies are the Jews. So Iran is a Shiite country. Iran is funding Hezbollah in Lebanon, who is also Shiite. Iran is funding Hamas and Gaza, which is Sunni. We, on our mind, a lot of people tell me, oh, well, but the Jews and but, but the Shiites and the Sunnis are fighting each other. Yes, they can fight each other, but they come together as one when they are fighting their enemy. You know the saying, it's me against my cousin, but my cousin and I are against our enemies. And so when you're looking at Iran, Iran is the Shiite army, a Shiite country, funding both the Shiites and the Sunni in order for them as Muslims to defeat their enemy. And that's where you see the cooperation. Okay, so so do you see that there is any hope of a two-state solution that they've been talking about for decades and decades? I mean, after Israel literally handed Gaza in 2005 under Ariel Sharon, Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, he literally gave them Gaza. And, and it was a, a huge um, difficulty for Israel because they even took up the graves 
of, of any Jews. They removed all Jews. And I've, I've had Jews say now they wouldn't feel safe going over to Gaza. They gave it to them. And now they've turned around and used this against Israel. I mean, what is the hope of having any kind of peace between the Jews and the Palestinians? Peace through strength. The only reason Jordan and Egypt came to Israel to initiate peace and ended up signing a peace treaty with Israel is because after the 1973 war, they realized we can't beat them. We might as well live with them. Because after the wars of 1967, after the war of 1973, and in every war where the Arabs tried to attack the Jews, the Jews ended up winning and expanding their territories. So finally, the Arabs realized, and starting with Egypt, which is the biggest Arabic country in the Middle East, they decided, okay, we're not going to be able to beat them. We need to live with them. And that's when you saw Anwar Sadat go to Israel and sign a peace treaty. That's when you saw later Jordan coming in and signing a peace treaty. And that's why when they tried to negotiate the Oslo Accord in 1993, when the Oslo Accord was signed, Israel thought, okay, great, we are on a roll. Now, Yasser Arafat wants to sign a peace treaty with us. The problem with Yasser Arafat is when they signed the Oslo Accord with Israel, Yasser Arafat used the treaty to turn against Israel. You know, there's an Islamic principle of war called um, uh, the war, the, 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 uh, the Hudaybiyah. And when uh, uh, the Arabic press would ask Yasser Arafat, how could you sign a peace treaty with Israel? You know, and he would say to them, remember al Hudaybiyah." Now, we in the Western world, you know, while the Israelis were singing, you know, Shalom Akhshav, you know, the movement, Peace Now movement in Israel, while they were thinking, great, we're going to have a two peace, two states side by side, us and the Palestinian, and we're going to have peace. The Treaty of al Hudaybiyah was signed because Prophet Muhammad, when he was uh, going into war, attacking the Meccans, one time they got into war at a city called al Hudaybiyah, and he couldn't defeat them, so they ended up signing a peace treaty. Prophet Muhammad used the treaty for two years in order to build his military, arm his military, re-strengthen and regroup, and then attack the Meccans two years later, and Mecca fell within 24 hours. So when Yasser Arafat was telling the Arabic world, remember al Hudaybiyah," what he was referring to is deceiving his enemy Israel, using the peace treaty with Israel, the Oslo Accord, to build his military, and then he turned against them. And that's exactly when the Intifada, the second Intifada started in 2000. And that's when we started seeing suicide bombing attacks against Israel. So what's the hope of a peace treaty between Israel and the Palestinians? Zero. They will not be able to have peace together. The only peace they will have is peace through strength. Is this at the very base of it? Is this just a, this is a religious war? They cannot, I mean, all of the, it seems like the different factions of is, Islamic different uh, particular groups, they all fight each other anyways, but then they all get together on one side to go against Israel. That's right, exactly. They will come together against Israel fighting together. And this is what we try to teach with my organization, Act for America, and I see the banners going on the screen. Act for America was founded to educate millions of uninformed Westerners about the threat of radical Islamic terrorism to world peace and national security. The, our national security, Canada's national security, Western national security, because we have to understand that there's an element within the Islamic world who wants to establish an Islamic government on earth and need to defeat the, Islam, the, the Jewish world represented by Israel, the Jews, and also the Christian world. And that's why they attacked 9-11, uh, the United States of America. And look, we have been fighting it globally now for over 20 years. So uh, I encourage people to go to actforamerica.org, check us out, sign up to get our emails and action alerts so you can understand why we together need to understand what we are facing and how we can organize to win our battle against our enemies, whether in Canada, whether in America, whether in Britain, whether in Australia, whether in Israel, this is a war. Right now, what's happening in the Middle East is dragging the whole world into war. I mean, look, we may be looking at World War III, and whatever happens over there ends up dragging our resources, because we are all members of NATO, Canada, the United States, England, France, Australia, 
all of us having to use our dollars instead of our dollars going to build our nations, to improve our nations, to build our infrastructure. We are losing our dollars to go fight wars over there instigated by a handful of radicals who are committed to wiping the Jews off the map, driven by hatred that we are paying the price to fighting whether we like it or not. Canadian dollars, American dollars, Australian dollars, European euros, we are all paying for this. And that's why we need to understand that this war over there affects all of us over here. And that's why we need to organize and put pressure on our elected officials, whether in Canada or in the United States or anywhere nationwide, because I know this show is going to be posted on the internet. You're going to have viewers worldwide on the internet from Western nations who speak the English language. You need to understand it's time to organize and mobilize in your communities and start putting pressures on your elected officials to do the right thing by standing for what is right and not by or supporting radical policies instigated by regular terrorist groups uh, in the Middle East. Well, what's happening in Canada is our prime minister now is opening the doors, uh, refusing to put a cap on the number of Palestinians that will now come from Gaza uh, to, to Canada. And that happened. They weren't initially going to be doing all of this, um, you know, maybe a few, but now the cap's been taken off because the Islamic organizations are putting pressure on our government while we, we, the Canadians, my roots in Canada go back to the early 1800s, apparently, I've just found out, uh, but I'm also American, but, but we, the people here uh, with our deep, deep roots tend to not badger and bother our politicians while the Islamic organizations have come in. And now we're going to have a lot of people coming and we're already concerned about these Palestinian protests that are sometimes violent erupting all over North America. Uh, and you should be concerned because look, uh, uh, when you are importing a group of people who are driven by hate, who are filled with hate, who have no problem dressing their own children in suicide belts and even taking videos of it and sending them to Israel to blow themselves up, the last thing you need to import is another wannabe suicide bombers who want to walk into your federal buildings and blow it up and our federal buildings and blow it up. We in Congress, we already lost. Extra America launched a campaign to a calling on our elected officials to bring zero Palestinian refugees into the United States. So you have to do the same thing in Canada. You have to start calling your members of Congress. Remember, elected officials care about things, and that is getting reelected. You have to get organized and make sure that you put enough pressure on your elected officials saying, we, you're going to lose your seat. We're going to campaign and we're going to get somebody to run against you and get them elected and get you out of office if you are going to vote for such policies. That's the only language they understand. We know in America that this is the only language they understand. We're extremely organized in the United States and doing that, and you need to do the same thing in Canada. Um, so, so were you saying that in the United States, are they letting in some Palestinians or have they decided not to do that? Zero. Act for America, my organization, which has over 2 million members nationwide. We reach 8 million people a day on our social media. We have uh, campaigns on our website, Stop Any Pal under Act Now campaign. If you go to Act Now on our banner, click on that, you'll see our national campaigns. And we you can search it by category. We have a campaign to stop any Palestinian refugees from entering the United States. And we preempted that before there was even a legislation introduced in Congress because we wanted to send a, a very strong message to our members of Congress that don't even think about it. We're not going to even allow you to even start going down that road. We want zero Palestinian refugees being imported into the United States. I think that Act Now campaign has over 1 million phone calls and emails that have gone to Congress demanding that we do not allow any Palestinian refugees into the United States. Well, that that is incredible. Were you shocked um, at the the revelation of this uh, um, the, the president uh, gay of Harvard having so little uh, 
discernment as to just completely blow that interview that she had at the Senate that has now cost her her job. When you watched all of that, what did you think? Uh, I th well, first of all, I watched clips of it because I couldn't stand watching it all day. You know, it was on all television in America, live all day long. It's like enough already with this garbage. Uh, but they had become so cocky, so belligerent, so confident, overconfident, because they thought my way or the highway, Congress can't do anything to me. They were so confident that there's enough support to their way of living because these people live in their own bubble. They think the rest of the country thinks exactly the way they do. They think the majority of the people think the way they do. Well, oopsie daisy, they realized that not all of America thinks the same way. People do not agree with the way they think. And people were repulsed at the, at the level of confidence, at the level of uh, uh, laissez-faire. They did not care uh, about the discussion. And I am so glad to see them receive the consequences that they received, all of them um, being put in their place and actually out of their uh, current positions because they deserve it. This is the last thing we need in our country. We do not need anti-Semitism. We fought so hard for equality in the United States, and I'm sure you do as well in Canada, that the last thing we need is go back to uh, uh, this anti-Semitism and this racism that we are experiencing. It is pure racism. It has no place in our country. We fought long and hard to eradicate racism, and, and it has no place there. And I'm so glad to see them kick uh, 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 her behind out of her position um, where, where, where she belongs. She does not belong as a president of Harvard. Yes, uh, th that, that was a very shocking, uh, you know, bit of, of drama that went on in the United States. And I think it maybe opened even the, the left's eyes because many of them support Israel. And that has been the stand of the United States uh, to support Israel. And so this was shocking to see. And doesn't it go to what's happening in our universities? Uh, are you concerned about the universities, the young people? And I, I'm, I'm sure you're trying to reach into that because you would be the perfect voice uh, to, to speak with them. Uh, yeah, look, the problem with the left in our country is the majority of the Jewish community were lefties. 80% of Jews in America vote with the Democrats. Actually, 80% of Jewish people in America vote for Black Lives Matter, supported Black Lives Matter, funded Black Lives Matter. And they are realizing it was the Jewish community that realized that while we stood for all the woke policies on college campuses, uh, a lot of Jewish children decided to go to these universities because they wanted to support the woke ideologies. And they realized all these people hate us. They don't really like us. Black Lives Matter was the first lefty organization to put on their banner a paraglider, a Hamas paraglider flying into Gaza. And I think only then that the Jewish community woke up and they started organizing and saying, we are pulling our money out. We are not going to give you any money and we are going to mobilize our own people to start putting pressure to get you out of your position. And you know, money speaks and that's exactly what spoke to basically get gay out of her position and the other uh, presidents of other universities that got them out of their positions as well. It is it is about the money. And uh, one of your initiatives on your site, um, actforamerica.org, everyone, this is uh, this is a site that you all need to be familiar with. But you're talking about stop U.S. aid funding Palestinian terrorism. And uh, this is a, a, a very shocking percentage you have listed here. Ninety eight percent of the Arab Muslim settlers in the West Bank hate America, as do 96.8 percent of those in Gaza. Um, do you believe that it has been the Biden administration that has funded Iran, thereby funding these other initiatives. It all goes to money, but he, this is a failed policy. Donald Trump left them broke is my understanding. Donald Trump left them on life support. Iran was falling when Donald Trump uh, left office. The first day Biden came to power, he reversed all the policies of President Trump. And that's the problem. Under Obama, Biden and Obama sent Iran money. Remember in the middle of the night on pallets of cash that landed in the airport that Biden, uh, Obama sent to Iran. This is why we were tr st trying to stop the Iran deal back in 2015, 2016. And then President Trump won and he immediately instituted the sanctions against Iran. When Biden came, 
He erased all the sanctions, opened up the floodgates, and flushed Iran with cash. And so this is exactly what's giving Iran the funding to fund Hezbollah, to fund the Houthis in Yemen, to fund Hamas in Gaza. And that is the problem. And, you know, by the way, the, 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 the poll that you mentioned that we recite on our website, that was the latest poll done by a Palestinian, uh, bolstered by a Palestinian research firm out of Ramallah. So it was shocking to hear the numbers. And so the numbers, when people read those on our website, this is directly out of the Palestinian research uh, firm in Ramallah that did that poll. So it goes to show you that we. Th this is exactly another reason why Canada should not allow any Palestinian refugees from Gaza. You are importing people that hate everything you stand for. And it's basically importing problems to your country. I see that one of the initiatives as well, you're also concerned about this movement towards uh, electrical vehicles, which are failing terribly in Canada for sure right now with the cold and also in the United States. It's a joke. It really is. Um, and, and so you are even, uh, you know, looking at things like this. You're you're basically you're helping the whole world with all kinds of issues. Uh, so uh, wh why has this been something that's been on your heart for a ACT? Uh, for America.org. Uh, look, the preservation of our culture, the preservation of our national security, all these issues are very important to us. These are at our core. And when we see how we are exporting everything and giving power to China, uh, remember, do you realize that China is the biggest world, uh, number one world exporter of electric vehicles? They're going to dominate the market. We are exporting everything to China. That endangers and weakens our national security. So when we reach out into issues like this, this, those issues in the long term affect American workers, affect American dollars, affect American infrastructure, affects American manufacturing, and affects America's strengths on the, on, on the global stage. This is why we stand for these issues. And I know we have a lot of Canadian Americans watching us right now. If you are an American, please make your voice heard because as an American, you have influence over elected officials here in Congress. I know a lot of people have dual homes between Canada and the United States. Uh, if you are a Canadian citizen, you need to start a movement just like this in Canada so you can start impacting policy. We, uh, we have impacted policy in such an amazing way in the United States. I'm proud to tell you we passed 210 bills on the federal level and the state level to protect the United States. And so the work that we do is on such a massive scale to impacting policy. There is no other organization in the United States that's doing and has the impact influence that we have in America, both on the legislative level, on the mobilizing citizens, on the grassroots level. This is the only way we're going to be able to save our nation. And I encourage you in Canada to do the same thing. You know, we used to have Act for Canada and we used to have chapters all over the uh, Canada. Uh, but you know, we 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 uh, didn't have anybody supporting it. So you need to start a sister organization, Act for Canada. You need to get it up. You need to get it going. You need to start chapters. That's the only way you're going to save your country. Yes, and and that could be uh, my dear friend um, uh, yeah. Tanya Gosh. She does uh, Action right. for Canada. Action for Canada. Some similar that's things. Right. Action for Canada. And yeah. that's how I connected with Tanya. That's right. Because she came together with Valerie Price, who was the head of ACT for Canada and who oversaw ACT for Canada. And then when she retired, she needed somebody to work with. And that's where Action for Canada uh, came together. So this is a great organization. It all boils down to action, not education. Education, you could listen to the radio, you could watch television, you could listen to podcasts. That's entertainment. If you watch this show right now, and you do not take action, you do not join Act for America, support Act for America, donate to Act for America, yes. join Action for Canada. If you don't do any of that, but just be entertained, you might as well would have been watching Dancing with the Stars. This is just entertainment. This is filling up time, filling up your mind with ideas and thoughts and information, which is, impo which is important, but it doesn't do anything to change your policy.
It doesn't do anything to impact your policy in government. What impacts policy is citizens mobilizing and taking action, pressuring their elected officials about laws being introduced or the passage of laws. That's the only way you're going to be able to secure your country. How how have you been able to do so much in the United States uh, with impacting the government? I mean, I, I know you have a much stronger Republican, uh, you know, a, a strength behind some of these people that that seem to have their own sense about what's right and wrong. In Canada, we pretty much have a uniparty. Uh, they all seem to pretty much feel the same way about, you know, gender issues. They all support the Ukraine war. Uh, the, you know, there's been um, uh, some similarities, but now, you know, Pr Prime Minister Trudeau is going to be backing off, I think, from his support from the Jews because the Islamic element here in Canada is going to be going very strong but we don't seem to be able to get the justice system on our side we really are seized that is the word that god gave me a year ago we are already seized and the fight is on and yes we need to do things but we have not been seeing the successes that we've hoped for in our courts the judges seem to be all compromised uh they are you know you know the saying an overnight success takes 20 years mm -hmm. they didn't get to this point overnight I started Act for America back in 2002, right after 9-11. And I worked at it and I worked at it, even when people did not want to listen to me. Even when people said, oh, there's nothing to worry about. Don't worry about it. Oh, Brigitte, you're exaggerating. Oh, you know, the, the gay agenda is not going to you know, get to where it is. No, the children, the schools are not being brainwashed. That couldn't happen. But I continued working no matter what people said, because I knew that the only way we can impact policy is by start putting pressure on our elected officials. And you know what they say? It doesn't take many to change the world. It only takes a dedicated few. The 2% of the passionate will always overrule the 98% indifferent. So when you look at the activism, you need to start somewhere. You need to start bringing together enough people who sit around the breakfast nook and start making a list of who their local representatives are and start talking to their neighbors. Hey, do you believe the same way I believe? Are you concerned as much as I'm concerned? If you are, join our meeting. We're meeting on Tuesday evening at my home. Everybody bring a dish. We're going to get together, eat dinner, and discuss how we're going to save our community. It can start neighborhood by neighborhood by neighborhood. That's how you're going to take your country back. Because remember, your enemies have much more passion than you do. And the only way to win against your enemies, those who have more passion are going to succeed. So that's exactly what you need in Canada. You need enough passionate and dedicated people to be willing to show up and get something done instead of waving the, the white flag and saying, ah, we lost already, why bother? You can't have that mentality. How involved are you going to be in this election coming up that you're having in the United States? Obviously, you love Trump. I just want to join you in that. I have the Trump bobblehead on my desk <laughs> to remind me to remind me of that. And I have people that are so mad at me because I'm a Trump supporter. I'm going to hear from Franklin. I know by the end of the day, there'll be a big email out to everyone that we talked about Trump. But I just I appreciate what you said about him. Um, he, the man is not a racist. He gave more money to the African-American community than Obama ever did. Uh, pretty much looks like um, he's leading the pack right now and he would definitely and, be and Biden. All, and all through his life gave money to the black community. It didn't start now because he's running for president. Mm -hmm. He supported the black community. He was one of their major donors for decades before he ever ran for president. There's a difference between a politician trying to do something because now they're running for office and they want to make a name for themselves. Donald Trump, did all the good deeds that he did and supported everybody before he ever ran for president. He wasn't even considering running for president. He only ran for president when he realized America is on the brink of collapse. And when he became president of the United States, he imported back manufacturing. He imported back jobs to America. He fixed our economy. Dollar uh, a gas was a dollar seventy five cents a gallon. Our military was secure. He started space uh, 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 army. He brought America back. Iran was on the brink of collapse. In four years under President Trump, we did not have one war. Everything that the left accused him of doing, oh my God, he's going to drag the world into World War III. 
It's Biden and the left who dragged the world into World War III, not Trump. Under Trump, we had no wars. We had no problems. Terrorist attacks stopped. He defeated ISIS and Al-Qaeda. And what did we have under Biden in three years under democratic control? The war in Israel and in the Middle East. War in the Ukraine and the Russians. War, I mean, look at Pakistan now bombed Iran. I mean, the whole world is falling apart under him, not to mention the economy, the global economy. And this is why I support Trump. And for those who hate Trump, I want you to just please listen to the reason. People tell me, why do you support Trump? We can't stand him. We can't stand his tweets. We can't stand his personality. People tell me that. And I tell them, look, I'm a businesswoman. I started my career in television production. I owned a TV production and advertising agency. I worked in TV for my whole career before I decided to become the chairman and CEO of a nonprofit. And as you can tell, my nonprofit is pretty successful. Look how influential we are. Look at the bills we passed, 210 bills in Congress. Not shabby for an immigrant who came from a town of 900 people in Southern Lebanon. So what, what my point is, when you are hiring a CEO to run your company, you don't hire a person because, oh, I like my friend. He's so great or she's so great. She's got a great personality. She dresses so well. She's so wonderful. You don't hire a CEO to run your corporation because they have a great personality. You hire them because they are good at what they do. They can balance the checkbook. They can look at the performance. They can write great business plan. They can project the market. They can tighten infrastructure. You hire them because they are good at what they add, not because they have a good personality. We need to stop. I know a lot of people in the political world get invested in personalities. Look, when I started Act for America, I've seen personalities come and go. I started Act for America, George Bush was in office. George Bush came and went. Obama came and went. We McCain, hope. Romney ran and lost. Trump came and went. Now we have Biden. What? So what stays is policies, not the person. Biden will be gone next year or in four years. If Trump gets elected, Trump will be gone four years after that. You're going to have another person. Don't look at the personality. Look at the policies. That's what matters. Hmm, that is that is absolutely incredible advice and the one of the most succinct and perfect ways of saying it that I've ever heard. And I completely 100% agree with you. You have written a book called Rise. Please tell us about this book and what, what brought you to the place of writing it. Uh, thank you. Rise is my third bestseller and it's titled Rise in Defense of Judeo-Christian Values and Freedom. And the book is about Western civilization was founded on Judeo-Christian values. The values of do unto others what you want others to do unto you. You know, we have people in America who don't, who have never even read the Bible, who are atheists, tell their son, now Johnny, treat others the way you want to be treated. Where do you think that comes from? Our whole culture is based upon these principles. That's what made Western civilization great. What makes my book so unique and so different than any other book is I not only educate, because as you can tell, I know my topics, I can educate you from now until the cows come home. But what makes the book is so unique is no matter what I'm talking about, at the end of every chapter, I have a section titled Rise Up and Act, where I give people three things they can do in 10 minutes to make a difference for the country, and they can do it sitting in their pajamas, sipping their cup of coffee. Uh, I'm talking about keyboard activism. And that's why I always drive people to Act for America. I tell people, sign up to get our emails and action alert. Go to actforamerica.org, especially if you are an American watching us right now. Go to actforamerica.org and sign up to get our emails and action alerts. And right now, I think we have a special promotion. If you make a donation to Act for America, you'll receive the book autographed uh, for a certain donation. So you'll get a tax deductible donation for getting the book. And so that's what the book is all about. It's about why we need to stand up and defend our education, defend our military, defend our infrastructure, defend our culture, defend our values, because we are seeing our values being stomped upon by people we are importing to our country who do not share our values. Not only they don't share our values, but they despise everything we stand for and are trying to turn our countries into the countries that they left behind. 
And that is a tragedy. So really, uh, we need to get to the place where we're not being so politically correct that we're being having all this inclusivity and, you know, don't be a racist. If you dare say anything against Islam or the radical Islam that you see, you know, affecting your own nation, uh, you see these these protesters. This is a big wake up call for my friends. Uh, because we're going, how, there's thousands of them, and and they're all like, you know, from the river to the sea. They're they're yelling that in our Canadian cities, and and we're like, what are you talking about? You're talking about the decimation and the annihilation of the Jews, and and you're doing it as if we would support something like that right in our streets, and and our police are kind of like deer in the headlights. Where the the Freedom Convoy 2022 that I was a part of. You know, we had rubber bullets shot into unarmed citizens because we thought we had we should fight for our bodily autonomy and freedom. And so this is just everyone's confused. Our government doesn't know how to lead. And thousands of them are here. And now we're bringing in more. The only person daring enough, and I'll give you this name, Maxime Bernier, the only person daring enough as a politician in an unelected uh, political party as of yet. He gave up his his seat in an elected political party because he said they were corrupt and compromised. So now we have Maxime Bernier who's always speaking about mass immigration and the problems that we have, but nobody, everybody's too afraid to look like a racist. Well, fear is gonna make them lose the country. And this is why I tell people in America, wake up, wake up, wake up. This is not against uh, a certain group of people who are of a certain color. This has nothing to do with color. This has to do with values. This has to do that with the type of people that we have in our countries. Look, I'm an immigrant to the United States. I was not born here. I love America. I love Canada. I love Western civilization. These are my values. These are the values that I grew up in. I was not taught to hate anybody. We want people who come to our country who are taught to respect our laws, respect our values, stand up for democracy. We do not want people marching in our street, waving another country's flag, screaming death to the Jews from the river to the sea. They, Those people do not represent our values. And that's what I'm talking about. And I think Amer Canadians are shocked as well as Americans thinking, how can we have all these people? I mean, in, in America, they were tearing down American flags in New York City while they were demonstrating waving Palestinian flags from the river to the sea. And we're looking, who are these people? How did they get into our country? So now Act for America has a bill in Congress introduced to put a cap on our universities from accepting foreign students from hostile countries, uh, because right now we don't have a cap. You know, universities can take as many students as they want, uh, fully funded by foundations from the Middle East. And this is how they are being flushed with cash. And this is how we are seeing all these people marching in our streets. They're not Canadians. They're not Americans. They're foreign students. And they are poisoning the minds of our own children uh, who are marching in the streets with them, not knowing what they're saying. Wow. Uh, this has been such a pleasure and an honor for me, a, r a real honor to be with someone as courageous as yourself, making a difference, literally changing the world. That's what you're doing. Can I just ask you one final question about your family of origin? So were your, your parents then were Christians in Lebanon and you, you were raised in? Yes. And, and are Correct. they as Lebanon alive? Or? Used to be, mm -hmm. Lebanon used to be the only majority Christian country in the Middle East 40 years ago. Lebanon used to be 67% Christians. Today, the Christians are less than 15%. Mm. It happened in my lifetime. Look how fast things are progressing. They have multiple children. In my case, I'm an only child. My parents passed away. I became an orphan at the age of 22. I lost both my parents within nine months of each other. Mm. And I had no one left in the world. So I understand what happens when people turn a blind eye to evil thinking it's not going to happen to me. I made it my life's mission to stand up and fight evil. And by the way, both my parents are buried in Israel on Mount Zion with Oscar Schindler. If you have ever walked by, uh, to visit Oscar Schindler's grave, you have walked by my parents' grave. Wow. So they were born in Israel. Oh, no. They were born and raised in Lebanon. Born they and raised died. in Lebanon, sorry. Yeah, they're Lebanese, besides Lebanese, and I lived in Lebanon until I was 24 years old. I moved to Israel at 20, tra traveled between Israel and Lebanon between 20 and 24, and I ended up coming to the United States. Wow. I was 24 years old. 
Well, you know, the next time that I'm in Israel, I've been twice. I've had the pleasure of that. I intend to go again. I'm going to see if I can look that up. And and I just thank you. Um, this has truly been wonderful. Um, everyone, Brigitte Gabriel, her book, The Rise. Uh, make sure that, how do we get this book? What's the best way to get this book? Uh, people can get it on Amazon, but also they can go to our website, actforamerica.org. And for a donation, they can get the book and give a tax deductible donation that can support our work and our cause. I absolutely love it. You're beautiful. You're amazing. And you're an inspiration you. to me personally. And this has been uh, a real treat today. Thank you for speaking the truth with courage, without apology. We appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate you having, you, having me with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, isn't she lovely, everyone? <laughs> that is one spitfire. <laughs> she can change the world by herself, you know? Um, you look at people um, who, who have so much and yet they don't do too much with their life. And then you look at someone like Brigitte uh, losing her parents at the age of 22. Um, perhaps that was literally what spurned her on to find such strength to stand. Sometimes when you feel like you're alone, it's not such a big uh, deal to just, you know, well, I'm already here. I'm already by myself. I might as well do this. And she would have had to go through several steps here to embrace that she would be hated by certain factions of the world, that certain people would not like what she's dishing out. But like she said, you're not there when you're going to make a difference. You're not there to always be the most popular or the most liked and everyone likes your style. Although what's not to like about Brigitte Gabriel. But when I did share her, some of her stuff, you know, with a Muslim friend of mine, he, you know, he was not appreciative. And of course, that's because there's this difference in religion, different difference in perspective. And uh, so I find myself wanting to get as much information so that I can very easily speak to the issues and share that information with you. You have something, JT? People should watch yesterday's show. Yesterday's show. It was phenomenal. Yesterday's show with Dr. J. Smith, the, uh, the truth about Islam and the Quran and giving uh, incredible information on uh, the Islamic religion and i recommend everyone to go in to see that what we have is we have a situation here where uh there are certain radicals in the world and i know you know the democrats now feel that that trump somehow is the radical oh he's the dictator it'll be the end of democracy if we let donald trump in you know, and he's like, okay, governors, do whatever you like. Uh, let's not have all of these rules. He didn't want to follow all the rules of, you know, that everyone put in. He is nowhere near a dictator. Uh, that's just crazy. Uh, this is a man who loves America and is going to fight. And I know, uh, you know, there's been uh, different different people who are upset about him over certain things, but we certainly cannot have another four years of these Democrats. No matter who you get in that office, they're going to continue. Uh, the destruction of America as Joe Biden has done in the last uh, four years. What an absolute decimation of a beautiful country. And whatever happens there, it affects us. And we've got the Build Back Better buddies, Biden and Trudeau, hanging out. Uh, they're all speaking the same language. They've all got the same ideas. And now we're going to be opening our borders to people who do not share our values. This is not about race. This is not about the color of your skin. I tell you something I would love. You want to bring in 100,000 people every year? You want to bring in 200,000 people a year? Hey, why don't we rescue the Nigerians, the Christian Nigerians that are being murdered? Why don't we bring in people from Uganda, a very, a, a largely Christian um, country? Why are we not bringing in people that share our values, that are peaceful people, that understand nonviolent uh, lifestyles and embrace peace? You know, uh, I mean, we've re just really got a problem. This has nothing to do with race. And for, for whatever it's worth, I'm African-American, okay? I'm African-Canadian because I was born in Africa. I'm more African than some of the, the uh, you know, the people of a darker hue might say, right? I feel very African, but I absolutely loved, 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 loved growing up in a nation where I, I was the one sometimes, uh, you know, the outcast because I was the white girl <laughs> at different times. But then I went up to the high Arctic and I lived among the Inuit 
And sometimes I was a bit of an outcast there. I was the only blonde girl in the entire school. You know, live, live my life for a while. So I don't like racism. I don't like bullying. I don't like treating people badly because of the color of their skin. I've experienced that myself. I really appreciate though people that do share these values. And so that's what I really love about this book, The Rise, where uh, Brigitte Gabriel is going to talk about, we need to invest in values. Do we not appreciate the values of this country? Now, you can be an atheist in Canada. You can be a Muslim. You can be, um, you know, uh, anything you want, uh, you know, Hindu, whatever. It doesn't matter because Canada embraces Judeo-Christian values of freedom. That's how you get to do that. Other countries don't embrace freedom. They don't embrace Christianity. Now, atheism, uh, I think in, in North Korea, you'd be really welcome. You might not be welcome if you're, you know, LGBTQ there. I don't know. I don't think so. And I don't think any of us want to live in North Korea. Uh, but if, if you want to go to places like Syria and most places in the Middle East, you're going to be very, very uh, persecuted uh, for being Christian, LGBTQ, any of these things. What do we have here? We have a society in Canada, in North America, founded on Judeo-Christian values, which means we embrace freedom. The freedom for you to reject God. As many of you have, you've, you've freely rejected God. You get that freedom and some deference, some kindness must be shown from your heart to the fact that it was this book and, and the person of Jesus Christ and his beliefs and God's idea that you would be able to embrace him or reject him. And that would be your free will and your choice because he only wants a people that love him because they choose to love him. And if you choose to reject him, you get to under these values. Anywhere else in the world, they tell you how to think. They tell you, they dictate to you how to think. So what are we doing now with our beautiful country that uh, our, our North American two countries, America and Canada, oh, we're just giving it all away. We'll bring in all kinds of people who don't share our values. They, they could be violent. Uh, they could be very supportive of Hamas. Which, by the way, many people here that are, you know, already here for many, many years do not see Hamas and Hezbollah as terrorist organizations. And, and that is scary because clearly what they are, clearly what they are is terrorist organizations. So this is a problem, isn't it? All right, we'll move on today. Um, here's our favorite min uh, minister in Canada, Christia Freeland. And uh, she is speaking at the WEF on Canada's willingness to decarbonize. Who's she speaking for? This is for? a hugely transformative moment in the whole global economy. Uh, I think that right now we're living through a moment which is comparable only to the industrial revolution itself in terms of the energy transition and the way we need to retool all of our manufacturing. That is huge. Canada's strategy, Borgay, is to say, look at these two trends and let's see how we can use them to play to Canada's strengths. And our view is there's a lot that Canada can offer to the world in this moment. You know, we have the critical minerals and metals that you need to build a green economy. We have a lot of clean energy. 85% of our grid is already clean, and we are investing heavily in building more clean energy. We are a country that believes in manufacturing, has manufacturing know-how and capacity. And then you guys spoke about industrial policy. You know, the thing that is new about industrial policy is we are developing our economies, growing our economies at a time when we also need to accomplish the green transition. And I spoke yesterday to a very significant international business leader who is also a big investor in Canada. And he said to me, all the countries in the world need to be very careful that decarbonization does not mean deindustrialization. I thought that was an extremely smart comment, and Canada is absolutely determined that decarbonization for us will mean more jobs, 
more growth, more manufacturing, and we recognize government needs to play a role to make that happen. So is, is that a Ukrainian uh, thing on her uh, lapel there, a Ukrainian colored uh, little, like, I don't know, wouldn't it be nice if she was wearing the flag? The Canadian flag as she represents our country at the WEF? <laughs> we don't care. We don't think she represents us at all. You know, yes, we have frozen your accounts. That's right. Yes, we have. Yes, we have. You will not be able to access any of the funds in your accounts because you're evil, evil. Um, you know, wow, she kind of seemed to be together and not having those ticks that she normally has, which is very interesting uh, there. But um, they don't care about us. Have you looked at, have you seen any of the videos of all the people that are absolutely irate because their their electric cars don't work in the snow? Like uh, the, the, the cold is killing the batteries to begin with. How much are those batteries? Those bar batteries are practically as much as the whole car in, in some yeah, cases. It depends. You know. it depends. Um, and so, so the, the whole idea of having an electric car, you know, okay, I'm going to drive to, to Costco now and then uh, I'll, I'll plug in my car while I'm in there because it's going to, you know, I'm going to need a charge to get back home. It's just so dumb. Like, do not get an electric car, you know. Um, it's uh, ridiculous. So I'm, I know some of you already have them and some people like them. And, you know, if you have, uh, if you have an inner uh, you just want to go inside the city. You don't want to go on long trips and you want to have a car that's, you know, maybe more economical in that way. I don't know if in the long run it's more economical once that battery dies. I don't know. But this is, you know, problematic. Um, but the whole thing is we're getting we're getting really clean engines these days. We're learning how to deal with uh, the negative effects of, you know, the gas or, you know, pollution in the air. I mean, I remember air care. Man, we changed, we think, I hated air care. It was so annoying, but I'll tell you, I sure appreciated how it cleaned up the air. You had to make sure that your engine was in good running condition and that it wasn't spewing black smoke everywhere you went. I mean, that was just something that you needed to do with your vehicle. You had to take good care of it. Now they've taken out air care. Why'd they take out air care? Do you know? Do you have any idea, JT? No, he doesn't know. He's uh, absolutely no help to me at all right now. But uh, <laughs> but I don't know why. I thought maybe that was a good idea. I mean, sometimes you could cheap it out because you could put this additive. Didn't you do this once? You put an additive into the gas, yeah. and then you go back through a different air care, and yeah. it's fine. <laughs> yeah. So you could totally, you know, you know, cheap out on it or or fool it, right? You could cheat. Um, so Argentinian uh, President uh, Javier Millet giving a warning about socialism at, uh, to the socialistic WEF. Good for him. Another conflict presented by socialists is that of humans against nature, claiming that we human beings damage the planet which should be protected at all costs, even going as far as advocating for population control mechanisms or the bloody um, abortion agenda. Unfortunately, these harmful ideas have taken a strong hold in our society. Neo-Marxists have managed to co-opt the uh, common sense of the Western world, and this they have achieved by appropriating the uh, media, culture, universities, and also international organizations. The latter case is the most serious one, probably, because these are institutions that have enormous influence on political and economic decisions of the countries that make up the multilateral organizations. Fortunately, there's more and more of us who are daring to make our voices heard, because we see that if we don't truly and decisively fight against these ideas, the only possible fate is for us to have increasing levels of state regulation, socialism, poverty, and less freedom, and therefore uh, will be um, f having worse standards of living. The West has unfortunately already started to go along this path. I know to many it may sound ridiculous to suggest that the West has turned to socialism, but it's only ridiculous if you only limit yourself to the traditional economic definition of socialism, which says that it's an economic system where the state owns the means of production. This definition in my view, should be updated in the light of current circumstances. Today, states don't need to directly control the means of production to control every aspect of the lives of individuals. 
And that's exactly what they want to do. They want to control every aspect of our lives. And I just watched an old clip, I believe, from a former WEF uh, forum uh, where they basically are saying, you know, to have the carbon footprint, to know where you're going, what you're doing, how much gas you're using, who knows what you're eating, what your heart rate is. I don't know. Isn't this the whole thing that Yuval Noah Harari is talking about where they, they literally want to know everything about your person and it's just frankly none of their business. They're taking away the sovereignty of your being. And that was God's idea. God's idea. He, God didn't put us here to be subject to these uh, narcissistic psychopaths at the top of the food chain that basically are, are saying that we have to depopulate the world. I mean, that's not, that's not it. God gave us humanity, the dignity of, of the be and the beauty of humanity so that we would come come to this world, that we would rule and reign, that we would have dominion over the earth. And that has been taken ever since the fall because the devil hates us and wants us dead. So he uses these minions, uh, these crazy people. And I don't even know if, like, who's, who's really running it? We've had people on this show, and I'll just remind you of this, that they basically say we might not ever know the faces and the names of those that are truly behind these world elites that are want to, to harm us. They are actually as well just the puppets. Because we always say, well, you know, Trudeau, he's a puppet of the WEF. He's a pu puppet of Klaus Schwab. Well, who's Klaus Schwab the puppet of? Somebody. Something's going on. There is some kind of craziness. And it is hard. You know, I just released a newsletter this morning talking about how we're all living in the Truman Show and, and how it's very difficult. Because it's like these stage players, they've got to be Flipping kidding. How can you think that America is better off with four years of Biden? How can you when you've had millions and millions and millions of illegal sex traffickers, criminals, we don't know, terrorists, Chinese military aged fighting men, 26,000 coming in the borders. And, and, and yes, it's, it's all fine. How can you, how can you still support this regime? How can you, with any integrity, say this is all better? Uh, when we look at inflation, when we look at the dollar, what's happened? Everything's much worse. You know, uh, the military, the military seems to have been seized by something. They, they all want to teach everybody pronouns. How about teaching people how to fight for our country? And don't, don't ask them to go fight for another country because I do not want to put my children and grandchildren in, in any military, any longer, that's going to fight one of your useless wars. You bunch of crazy people. Leave my family out of it. You know, I, I used to be so proud. Oh, you got to fight for your country. My grandfather uh, was in World War II. You know, um, I, I, I just thought this is what you do. You fight when communism or someone's trying to take over your country. And now I'm like, oh, we got to be prepared to fight them. That's what we need. Everything's upside down. All right. Have you ever heard of uh, Echoside? Get ready because you're going to be hearing that term a lot more. Take a listen. I mean, Ecoside as a word is becoming more, it's becoming better known around the world. And the concept is generally mass damage and destruction of nature. Um, but legally speaking, um, what our organization and other collaborators aim to do is to have this recognized legally as a serious crime. Because one of the issues that sort of pervades all of this discussion is that we have a kind of cultural, very ingrained habit of not taking damage to nature as seriously as we take damage to people and property. Um, and that, I mean, you know, if you're campaigning for human rights, at least you know mass murder, torture, all of these things are serious crimes. But there's no equivalent in the environmental space. Um, and so, and, and you know, unlike a, an international crime like genocide that in, involves a specific intent, with ecocide, what we see is actually what people are trying to do, what businesses are trying to do is make money, is, you know, is farm, is fish, is do all of these things that are, um, you know, producing energy and so on um, as well. But what's it, what's missing is the awareness and the conscience around the side effects, around the collateral damage that happens with that. Are you a fisherman? You eco-cider, cytomaniac? What, what are we going to call these people? Eco-cytomaniacs? Eco Eco-cytal maniacs. Have you heard that word yet? I officially I'm declare I made it up. 
Yeah, register it now. Go, website. yeah, go. That's our word. <laughs> you ecocidal, you farmer. What are you thinking? Growing food all the time. Do you know how dangerous this is to humanity? I mean, what is wrong with you? You're you're damaging the ground every time you till it up, you know, and then you're putting seeds in there and then burying it again. Do you know how many little bugs probably die as you're doing that? I mean, you're you're fishing, you're growing cows, you've got you've got a, a, a cow uh, you know, grouping, uh, you're just sick people. I mean, you've got to get those things vaccinated, counted, and when we tell you you need to just, you know, equal a whole bunch of ecocidal maniac, uh, a whole bunch of uh, those cows and kill them off. I mean, they're, they're, they're just crazy. This, this person just speaking here, what a nut. Who trained her? What, did she go to Harvard? I don't know. You know, what's going on? Like, we're doing just fine. They're creating a crisis so they can get billions of dollars poured into solving the crisis they created that never was a crisis. It's insanity. Don't believe any of it. Don't participate. Don't start eating crickets in your power bars. Okay? Read, read the descriptions, what's in there. Bill Gates in Davos. Uh, now he is promising more vaccines and new delivery systems for them. We make sure that for all these vaccines, uh, that there's enough capacity, uh, that there's competition so the prices keep going down. And we will have new vaccines. We'll have a, a TB vaccine, malaria vaccine, HIV vaccine, and even the things like COVID vaccines, we need to make them have longer duration, more coverage, uh, and we're gonna change instead of using the needle to use a little mm. patch. Uh, so the pandemic really highlighted that we've been underinvested in those innovations. And it, you know, our partners in India are, are part of how we're gonna uh, get these breakthrough products done. Okay. I'm just not going to talk about it because we're on platforms. Um, actor Alan Richson talks about the criticism he receives from some Christians for playing Jack Reacher. This is interesting. I love playing Reacher. I love uh, telling this story. I love playing a character who uh, creates a, a kind of moral ambiguity that we should struggle against as we consider whether or not what he's doing is good all the time or morally right. Um, I think that kind of thing is fun and fascinating. And I think escaping to that world um, as an audience, hopefully it's as enjoyable for you as it is for me to help bring it to life. Um, but it's funny to me how a lot of people criticize me, supposed Christians especially criticize me for playing Reacher. As if the only TV that, that should exist is seeing people silently folding their hands in, a, in the pew of a church. I mean, what kind of stories are we supposed to tell? If you look at scripture, what do you find? You see a thousand years of, a, of an infinitely holy, holy God holding tension with human beings as he tells the story of who he is, reveals who he is through an imperfect people. So we get stories, we get stories of, of, of paganism and uh, uh, a war and bloodshed and ghost stories, mysticism. We see uh, uh, miracles and magic and uh, uh, we see life and resurrection and, and death. And uh, we see this incredible canvas where God is completely unafraid to tell the story of who he is through um, less than morally ambiguous characters, through through pure evil sometimes, you know? So um, I think it's uh, laughable when people criticize me for playing characters that are not like saintly, you know? That's not my job. And I don't think God cares about only telling those kinds of stories. I think we can start conversations and we can reach people through these mediums in a way that um, I think God enjoys. And so here we are now where we can get to the heart of the matter, where God has built a platform because of this show for me, where I can reach people who maybe don't think about these things all the time. And maybe, maybe for those who are struggling or feel lost or want to try something new, um, they can find something that brings them hope like my faith has mine. I love him. Don't you love him? Okay, so he plays a bad guy. He's acting. He's acting. I don't know why Christians would... Would, yeah. No, no, yeah, Jack Reacher's a, a good... Oh, he doesn't play a bad guy. Right. No, but he, he does maybe some things that would call into question in, in the movies or whatever. Or, and in the books. My son reads the books, but uh, might say, oh, maybe it's not such a, you know, a, a real moral thing to do. You know, so he gets a hard time from Christians. Well, it's not going to come from this 
uh, from this gal here. I think he's absolutely wonderful. Okay, so uh, this Saturday, the UFC comes to Toronto main card contender. Uh, Sean Strickland has some questions for the Canadian media. And am I supposed to be? No. Okay. Sean, uh, Neil Davidson from the Canadian Press. Welcome mm. to Canada. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> yeah, fucking the Canadian Press, man. Were you, a, uh, were you a, uh, a COVID bank account stealer too? Were you on board with that? No. I, uh, Are you left wing or right wing? Were you a, were you a Trudeau? We got one of the, we got one of the <laughs> commies with the press. We got to know where this man stands. Were you non-biased? I think I'll ask the questions here. Oh, he thinks he'll ask. Oh, we <laughs> know. Maybe I should just pass on this mother. He's gonna go back. He's gonna go back and can give my bank account information. Fucking Trudeau. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we had to take out a lot of swear words for that. But you know, that guy just called him up, right? The mainstream media guy, right? They all participated in you know the tyranny of Canada, and this guy knows about it, and I love it. And he called, you know, sooner or later, media, the people maybe. You know, that you don't think they're anything today, but an, on another day, in, in another year or two, who you hurt on the way down is who's coming right up and is now not going to be taking your questions anymore. So I like the way he did that. He should have just ignored that. I want to let you know about an A guy conference that is going on. Um, and this is in Calgary, Canada. Super fun. Can you put that uh, big JT so that I can actually read it? Is it easy to do that? Um, yeah, Calgary, Canada. So, uh, at Southside Victory Church, they are going to be having an incredible chat about experience the future with built for AI. Unlock the potential of AI, experience how it can be used for good. Join us to explore how artificial intelligence AI can be a beacon of, I'm assuming it says hope and light. <laughs> I don't know. All right. I mean, this is the thing. So we've got this whole new genre that's coming in. People are saying that AI within six months is going to really transform the way that we operate, the way that we all do things. And um, I did show you at one point how AI was able to take my voice and my person and put it into Spanish and uh, Cantonese or whatever I was speaking. Um, I'm not certain, but uh, it's able to put your voice into 60 languages. Now, I feel that there needs to be laws that, that let the viewer know that it's AI. That's where I think this needs to go because you know how they're putting out a whole bunch of things right now and you think that it's Tucker Carlson or you think that it's so-and-so um, and yes, the heavier milieu. You have a, oh, okay. So we just showed you that heavier milieu, Malay, uh, am I saying it? Malay uh, clip. So someone has already done. A, an AI version of it, and he's speaking perfect English, I guess. And so it, it's giving you good information. Now, something like that is going to, to change the world. We're going to be able to understand what someone in Germany is saying. Um, Gary, uh, senior uh, producer Gary is not going to have to sort of let me know, hey, you got to follow the, what's happening in, you know, Denmark or, you know, this Danish clip uh, and you got to read it and all of that. They're going to be able to do that. So, so news is going to be able to be right there in our own language, potentially 60 languages every single day. This is what's coming. So you'll be able to have more information. At the same time, the bad guys are going to be able to make people say something they didn't say. Uh, they're going to, you know, this is my concern about this uh, a AI voice thing is that um, there's nothing you can really do about it. If somebody is going to take your voice and your person right now, I don't know that it's illegal make you say anything that they want, you know, like if you ever see me saying, oh, you know, I I love the devil or something like that. That's not me saying that. Uh, but somebody can take your likeness and alter it and can actually really use it for evil. So what I'm interested in is, is what is the good way of, of using AI? Do we get ahead of the curve? Is it important that we if we can't beat it, that we join it and understand how does it spread the gospel of Jesus Christ better? How does it get the good news 
of the power of the living God out to more people in their language. Is that important? Because maybe we should embrace this so that more people can know the truth. They can, more people can have the great teaching of some of the, you know, uh, pastors and leaders across North America. Or, you know, you've got these churches, Yonggi Cho, you know, in, uh, was that China, I think, that he had a huge church. And maybe it would be that some of these incredible preachers are speaking in their native tongue. We would be able to take that, put that in an AI script, and all of a sudden we understand everything that they're saying in perfect English. But it's an amazing, gifted man of God from another part of the world. So what else is AI going to do? You know, how is it going to mess with us? I'm very interested, uh, so I'm actually going to check that conference out. And um, we'll, we'll see what happens there. I'll, uh, so just one final thing. Let's put the poster back up of Tucker Carlson. And if you can get tickets uh, in Edmonton, that's the only place you can get those tickets. Please uh, come on down. That's going to be really fun, I would say. All right. Thank you so much. My website is laurelin.tv. Let me just share with you how much I appreciate you, how much I uh, love that you tune in when we go live and we can see you on the screen. We can see every number, every one of you that's watching on all the platforms. We can see that you're there yeah, on some live. of the platforms. What? We know where you live and we know where you live. Yeah. <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> we don't even know your real name because you just got your online name. But um, we love your comments. Thank you for sharing. Sometimes you donate little bits of money. I'm also on Brighteon now. And how many more people do we need on Brighteon to become? We, we get, uh, there's certain things. Okay, there we go. Uh, so this is my channel on Brighteon. And we're putting all of our stuff up there. We, we've never um, promoted it or anything. But we are now able to do 100 more. 100 more videos allowed because you get certain things uh but we it's really sad we have four subscribers seven seven okay it's a good day yeah, yeah. all seven right like, like. seven subscribers 10 likes <laughs> <laughs> so um if if you'd like to like are you able to put the bright tea on thing in the description or something or is it always there bright tea is there it's in the description if you could go there like and subscribe that would mean a lot it's all free and and uh, that gives us more access to getting onto different platforms and uh, sharing the word. So also, we are really uh, looking into what it takes to get onto Daystar for a half hour show. Um, this would be a real stretch for us financially. So um, we're, uh, I have a board because I have a charity and we are just, um, you know, going to be talking about it, praying about it, if the Lord will help us. Now, some of you out there might be able to really give us a hand with that kind of project. And if you are, means the world to us. Um, it would be several thousand dollars per month that we'll be needing, not asking you to do all of it unless you can. God bless you, we would love it. Um, but th this is, you know, whenever you take on more, you have to count the cost and then you have to be prepared for that. So we wanna do that, but right for now, Thank you for supporting this broadcast because this broadcast takes money. When you look at that donate button there, uh, you push the donate button on my website and you can uh, give a one-time donation. You can become a monthly partner. You can do it with your name included or anonymously. You can give any amount. You get an instant tax receipt because we are a charity that is uh, given to the mission of spreading the powerful word of God. And we do that every day on this show. And we look at society through the lens of, of how the Bible might see it, as you see on our show. So if you're able to help us, it, it's fantastic. It can also help you to get a tax receipt. Um, you can send uh, e-transfers to lauralynlive at protonmail.com or lauralynlive at gmail.com. Are you able to put that up there, JT? Or did you already do it? Maybe you already did it. I don't know. And also, we have uh, snail mail. We have box 48184, um, New Westminster. So that is my email. And then we have PO Box 48184, New Westminster, BC, V3M0A7, if you would like to send something by mail. We, we, we're just so grateful. It means the world. I have to tell you, it means so much from my heart 
that we're able to do this and that you care enough about what we're doing and you see how it's important. Because I'm here because this is a calling. I have a sense of urgency. Let me tell you, it keeps me up at night. Um, it, it puts me into high gear when I'm coming to see you on the show every day because I have a sense that we've got to get the truth out because it's pretty hard to find the truth. Have you noticed that? So I don't consider this to be just some menial task or something that I'm doing for fun. This is a calling. This is what we do as our family and uh, the, the ones that work with us and the volunteers. This is what we do to bring truth to God's world. And it's important. And I thank you very much for helping us do that. I was uh, awake this morning and I was listening to the word of God and I was completely uh, just immersed in Psalms. I went through, I actually listened Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah. I, I listened for several hours. So I was, <laughs> I, I, I went through a, a, a lot of stuff. I think we got through probably Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes and into the beginning of Isaiah. So that was several hours of just kind of listening to it. You can also listen to Bible Gateway, just so you know, you can listen to it on fast speed. So um, um, I like, you can play it in your kitchen and the word of God is just there. Cause guess who doesn't like to hang around you when you're playing the word of God? The Bible. I mean, sorry, the devil. <laughs> I know, sorry. <laughs> The devil doesn't like to hang out with you. Okay, so Psalm 75, it says, We praise you, God. We praise you, for your name is near. People tell of your wonderful deeds. Have you lived long enough to see the goodness of God? Have you lived long enough to live a miracle after you prayed through something? Or someone prayed for you? Have you lived to see the goodness of God? You say, I choose the appointed time. It is I who judge with equity. When the earth and all its people quake, it is I who hold its pillars firm. To the arrogant, they say, boast no more. No, God says, boast no more. And to the wicked, do not lift up your horns. Do not lift your horns against heaven. Do not speak so defiantly. This is a caution that the Lord is saying, I'm in charge. You get to be in charge of you and your will, but I'm in charge. Don't speak so arrogantly as to say, I made this or that happen. I choose the appointed time. I'm in charge of my whole life. To a certain degree, you do get to say yes or no to God. I pray you say yes. I really do. And I know many of you have. No one from the, the east or the west or from the desert can exalt themselves it is God who judges and he brings one down and he exalts another. In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out. Doesn't that give you a beautiful picture? In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. That sounds yum right about now. It's kind of cold out there. He pours it out and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. Oh dear. Okay. I, I'm not sure that that was saying that that was a good thing at all then, because I'm not going to be the wicked one taking that down. As for me, I will declare, it says this forever. I will sing praise to the God of Jacob who says I will cut off the horns of all the wicked, but the horns of the righteous will be lifted up. God says, he will deal with the unrighteousness. He will deal with the injustice. It's up to us not to declare that we're going to make such and such happen. Everything we're going through right now, my prayers are loosely held before the Father right now. I ask him, would you bring peace on earth? But your will be done. Because the Bible says that there's a time for peace and there's also a time for war. And I leave it in God's hands, whatever journey or path you want me to go on, because one thing is for sure, when God is in charge of your life, he makes it spectacular. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless. You know, it's not easy to deliver the truth of what our sick world is doing, but for some of us, we feel that we have no choice. 
Because if we are silent about these abominable things, then we are letting evil go unchecked and we cannot do that. For those of you wonderful people who are writing me and are sharing your encouragement, I am deeply grateful. Thank you for all the letters that you've been sending. Thank you for the donations and the support. I found out that in order to speak the truth, you have to become very, very strong. If you would go to my website at www.lauralyn.tv, you'll find all of the ways that you can contact me. Remember, my friends, all is well. All is well. Thanks for joining me.